Hello, hello, hello. Miss Mitchell. Welcome back to the channel and welcome back Matt Brown to the channel. And I'm so excited to bring back the, the voice type series. And we're going to start with the soprano voice. Then who other can teach us about it better than the one of the world's greatest and leading sopranos herself, Miss Leona Mitchell, 18 seasons at the Met, Grammy Award winning Leona Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure, Malik. You've just stirred up so much for me to be excited about, you know, to talk to the younger generation and it's, it's exciting. So thank you for having me. All right. So Miss Mitchell, to start off, what is the soprano voice? Hmm. All right. Well, for centuries, I guess, choirs have done soprano, alto, tenor, bass. So, so the soprano voice would be the highest voice of that uh, categories in, in voice. You know, singing, uh, I guess, from middle C all the way up to C5 or like that. So, soprano. And uh, could you explain a little bit the difference between a lighter soprano and a heavier soprano? Mm -hmm. Yes, because I think... Uh, Many sopranos, even uh, contraltos, can go to a high C, but the quality, I think, of a like a light lyric soprano versus a, uh, my kind of soprano, <laughs> which is a Verdian kind of soprano, is the weight of the sound in those notes. Uh, perhaps the lighter soprano can hit those notes, but it won't be a, a big volume, and it won't be as dark, let's say, as a, uh, a heavier soprano. So they can, a lot, a lot of times sopranos get in trouble that way too because they have the notes, but it's, it's the caliber of sound that one needs uh, to, to, to sustain these kind of uh, heavier voices than, you know, the lighter sobrette can. Whether she is a light or a heavier soprano, will she feel the transitions at similar places in the range? Hmm. I think, uh, yeah, the, 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 the sobrette, lighter soprano might feel the bridge a little bit higher than the, than the heavier soprano. For instance, I think for the heavier soprano, it could be like the, E or F above a G that when you're getting out of chest and getting into head tones might be a cutoff and perhaps for the lighter soprano that might be a little bit higher perhaps F G somewhere like that. But uh, so to clarify that's still within about a whole tone difference. Yes, yes, and you know what's interesting, Matt, about that is is uh, there has been a. I guess a talk about how they had raised or lowered the tones as be, uh, uh, nowadays versus in the 30s and things. For instance, a high C is really like a B natural. You know, it's the tuning that they've done with the, our tuning system, and for maybe perhaps the people in the 30s with the they weren't really singing a high C. They were singing a B natural. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And they, they, I had actually gotten people to write me and say if they would make the tuning go back down. Because it's really difficult, you know, for the heavier voice to keep scaling all the way up there to that C. So it's interesting. So um, we mentioned that the shift uh, around the bottom of the staff at E right. and F G around that area, mm -hmm. whether it's a heavier light soprano, that they'll feel it there. Um, are there any other shifts that are important in a soprano voice, and how are they managed? Um, for instance, to me, like a coloratura soprano, they are dealing with so many runs, and to, to, to get that correct, that they sometimes lose out on the uh, middle voice, keeping it strong, because they're so busy doing all those cadenzas and things. Sometimes they don't have time to work on and strengthen that voice from C to C, like middle C up to that C. Okay. And, that, and, and a heavier soprano, that's, uh, wow, that's from that C to that C, the D, E, F up to that area is really important in a dramatic soprano sound. The, Heft and the legato and things like that, but okay, but yeah, yeah, subrettes—they don't have to give such power in that area, 
you know, they their their strength is maybe F G A, you know, before the high C. Uh, it might be the Sabrettes, uh PowerPoint. Whereas I think, you know, a dramatic soprano, you really have to have a serious middle voice, and then scale off into that high. But the Sabrettes can just stay off. They can stay there. <laughs> It just keep okay. hitting little note after note. It's just pretty. It doesn't take. You don't have to get over so much orchestration, heavy orchestration, and things. And so it's, uh, it's, it's. And, and also, I think the roles that the sabrettes do. It's just the energy. The is not required. That that heft that you have to have when you sing a Aida or a Forza or things like that. Because I've done both. So I really know. <laughs> so it, it's a whole different uh, thing, category. So when you're starting to get to the top of the staff, mm -hmm. will the lighter soprano feel the shift higher than the heavier one also? Yes. Uh, it, it's amazing to me. I, um, I, I'm always just amazed at the lyrics because it's just easy for me. <laughs> To me, it seems like it, they, the, it's comfortable for them to be in that register. And I think because the heavier voice is dealing with this middle voice so much, you have to take care that you don't keep it too dark like a mezzo, whereas, which will make you not be able to hit the high notes because you're just spending so much time in that other area. And for instance, mezzos, they, their, their cream note, their top note is a, like a F, G. They can hit A's and B flats and C's, but they're at home at an F and G. Their power, you know, maybe it's a, a me, the kind of soprano I was might have been an A is my power note. And then the sabrettes, they're just a high A, B flat, C's. They're just comfortable. They can sing that all night long. And I, uh, my, my voice, it would be taxing. Mm -hmm. But still these differences are all within a minor third. That's it's right, small. that's right. It's right, because we're all, it's hitting the same notes, but it's the caliber and the, the way that you have to have the uh, strength, I call it, strength, which I had to, I came from a lyric. So that for me to hold the stage as an Aida or a Trovatore where you're out there sailing all night in that middle high range you have to have real power and real control of that and then still be able to hit that at sea when they want you to <laughs> you know like in Aida the Nile Ari oh my god you know you're still supposed to go to that kind of subret lyric thing of your voice and hit that and then still be able to all night long put put out the guns for the adults Aida's yeah mm -hmm. so speaking of a high C are you like how often would say like a soprano period or yourself how often are you expected to go above that the high c mm -hmm. in the, the dramatic repertory not very much at all but but if you cross for instance say not an opera but you're doing a oratorio or you know you could uh possibly hit you know, C sharps, and I think in Strauss, uh, some of his pieces of soprano, the heavy soprano, is expected to hit C sharp, D flats. But just touch it. You're not supposed to stay there. <laughs> that's that's maybe the good part about it. You're not supposed to stay there. So, yeah, but it's really needed, though. You have to have it. You have to have all of that. You have to have it all. But in the meantime, the majority of the pieces are in that other range, in that middle, high middle. Um, so um, on the topics of high Cs and these high notes that are a real trademark to the female voice, mm -hmm. um, what do you find to be the difference between a soprano and a mezzo with a high C? Mm. Well, the mezzos will tell you a lot about that. <laughs> I have a friend and, uh, you know, she told me, she said, well, Leona, now I can sing all of that. I can sing what you sing. She said, but I don't, I couldn't do it all night. I could, I would not be comfortable staying in your register all night. I can hit those notes and hold a long one here and there, but for me, it's not comfortable. 
it just doesn't lie in my voice. And I think, because she was being pushed to be a dramatic soprano, because she could, I mean, she sounded just like me, a soprano. When she would, I, summertime, I said, did you put that down? No, it was in the right key. <laughs> so she had, she had the ability to do that. She says, but I'm not going to let them talk me into this because I'd get into trouble later because I can't sustain it. I can just do it here and there. So I think the difference is a mezzo, they, they sing that all night. But see, you know, like in, in the scene in Aida, when the mezzo's doing that scene at the end, it, it's, it's amazing, you know, because she goes all up in that tessitura. But it's just for a moment. If she didn't do that all night long, <laughs> you know, so she can do that and it's comfortable. But yeah, I think that's the difference. between Can I follow up on what are like some of the consequences? Like what trouble does someone get into straining too high or trying to be an air that doesn't work? Well, I think I think you can just go to some of the European houses where they have house sopranos and all the, and I, and I, I, I didn't have to do this, but I had friends that were in these companies where they had them singing all different kind of repertory every day of the week. They treated them like cattle. Their voices, and, and they were young, you know, in their 20s and things, but their voices suffered immensely. They ended up with huge uh, warbles in the sound. They couldn't, uh, you know, the legato was gone. After a few years, the, it just took such a toll on these little chords, you know. Uh, uh, pushing like that, I call it pushing, and pushing it where it's not supposed to go. And even you can you can do that just studying with a teacher. I mean, if they're pushing you in a wrong repertory and you're just singing that pounding on that every day, and you don't really have space around the sound and things like that, you're just grabbing and trying to sing this and that. It can really make a toll on your voice. That's the horrible thing. And then even when you're trying to start, you can't when you get there because your voice is in ruins. Yeah. Yeah, in ruins. And I was always concerned about that. But, you know, thank God I didn't go there because I just really didn't like that. If your voice was showing tethers, I call it. <laughs> you wear and tear. And, and, and uh, as a matter of fact, I won't say the name, but one soprano, you know, at the end and, and and she was so well known but her voice started this big warble and uh the company was and she was at the top and they just were like how can we get her to maybe just bow out gracefully you know because pretty soon everybody started noticing you know after a while you're not a uh, broadway actress you're not a actress on tv so then people are coming to hear you sing so it's going to show eventually <laughs> you know they, they they may get excited about oh she's acting this so beautifully and blah, blah, blah. but pretty soon it became really 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 clear that that she was having serious vocal problems and, and i don't know why you know it's a combination of stuff but eventually finally they got her to just quietly leave yeah so just to quickly follow up the question about the difference between the soprano and the mezzo, where would you say the mezzo is most at whole? Like what part of the, like if you have to put it like a note range yes, on it? Yes, yes, yes. I, I think, I'm not a mezzo, but I think they're just totally comfortable with below the C, those B flats, A's, all the way up to an A is what I would say, but not always living in that A area. Like I said, F, G, <laughs> you know, from that low to A to A almost. Yeah, I would say that they're comfortable, but you would have to ask a mezzo. So that's what my mezzo friends tell me. Um, so another question that's uh, interesting because you do sing such a wide variety of music. Yes. Is a high voice a high voice in any repertoire? Is a high voice in classical music a high voice outside of it? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think I take the technique, whatever I've done in my opera singing, and it goes across the board to, uh, for instance, when you do recitals, you're just all in the lower part mostly. It's almost a mezzo range, a lot of the Schubert and all of that, but I certainly take my, me my soprano into that repertory it's not it's a soprano sound it's not a mezzo sound even though it's full and everything and then even in uh beethoven's ninth or you know any of those pieces yeah you just do your technique 
you know, the Verdi Requiem, any of those. You have to. And, and, and Malik, you just gave me that um, thing about make your garden grow. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a spot, you know, and I was singing that. But I sang it how Leona sang it, you know. It's interesting listening to everybody do their verse. But still, it was my technique, that same technique that I used in that to sing that song. What um, what part were you in gospel? Like, what part of the harmony did you sing or in the choir? The lower. That's really? why I'm singing the jazz now, because I sang really low. Yeah, yeah, I, I always liked the harmony. I didn't do the soprano. Every once in a while, you know, when they wanted a little like they do in Port Best, I would do a high C, throw it in, you know, in gospel with the James Cleveland sound. That's what I would do. You know, who is that little Richard or somebody? Woo! You know? <laughs> so, you know, we just put that in James Cleveland, you know, we put that high C somewhere, you know, like that. Yeah. But mostly the bottom. Yeah. But that was thrilling to people because, you know, all of a sudden you see it and then somebody's throwing in a high C. I wanted to uh, follow up because I believe you kind of made this statement, but I would like you to clarify it possibly. So even as like your range has grown throughout your career and throughout your training and throughout maturity, mm -hmm. you are still a soprano, even yes. if you might have lower notes now. That's you right. You will always be a soprano. That's right. That's right. And I'm, 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 I'm thrilled about that because to me, um, because I am a soprano, when I sing that low jazz, you still hear the hint of the space around the sound. It's not just pushing on the chords, you know? It's always still smooth and space around those, you know? You know, when I sang that little piece for you the other day, Malik, and when September goes, it's still soprano. Da, 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 dee, da, da, you know, and then I so I keep that, and I think that's interesting. It's very interesting, you know. Uh, what is this? So and when marimba rhythms start to play, dance with me, make me spray. When the ocean hugs the shore, you hear the soprano in it, even though it's really low. Hold me close, sing me more. Yeah. That's actually a good segue into the next question. So mm -hmm. you are known for your chest voice mm -hmm. and how much of it you have. Mm -hmm. What is the difference? Well, did you have that much because you are a heavier soprano or is that something you had to develop over time? No, but see, I brought it from my church. I, I was always, I had that you know, that affinity to have that. And actually, when I first started uh, uh, to take lessons, I it had to be taken away from me because my teacher wanted me to be a soprano. She said, you're not a low voice, so we're gonna take all of the chest voice away and you're only gonna sing in the head. So, <laughs> so she made me move up away from that depth to that because I, su I suspect if I'd been with some other teacher they might would have pushed me mezzo because I always had that that lower part and it was foreign to me opera was foreign to me I was used to singing in my chest and yeah so to you know I, I, I didn't have the opportunity like Lee and Tina those who were in the Methodist church that sang from hymnals and things you know so where they could develop a high tone so I just it was natural you know, I was just singing along and I heard somebody sing high and, you know, and then you get in your choirs in your schools and they, they kind of help you. So uh, then I figured out, yeah, yeah, I'm a soprano. <laughs> so As a matter of fact, in my, in, my, in my high school, I was in the, in the mezzo section. And one girl said, I was humming along with the sopranos, a high C. And, and I, was, I was sitting there, she said, Lee, uh, Miss, uh, the teacher said, can you, can somebody sing this? And she said, Leona can, I could have killed those. Because ah! <laughs> I was always humming with them. And so I sang it, and so she got me immediately out of that mezzo section and put me in the soprano. So you, so you already had the top, you came yeah. in with that. I, I had it, it was there. And I just didn't know, I, I didn't know what that was, you know, because I never explored that until high school, yeah until high school. I had a sister 
but she always sang high. She still she's eighty five and she still can sing a high C. That's what her voice her voice is lyric like that and you know I go oh gosh you know <laughs> she can just I was you know going oh me oh so and you know, and she just see <laughs> I'm like oh my god yeah so she really was a lyric lyric you know. So it sounds like you naturally just from the very beginning had a very wide range. Yes, I think so. I think so. I think that was, you know, what you call God given. I think that that's the case. And then uh, just thank God I got with people that could, you know, help me utilize it. Because it doesn't have to go that way, you know, it can be destroyed. You know, if you're with the wrong people, it can just be destroyed. Do you find in your experience that uh, a lot of sopranos uh, sort of have that high register just immediately, and maybe they were like you and unaware, but many of them typically just sort of have it? I think so. I think you're kind of born with it, uh, probably. And uh, either you can have used it or not use it, but I think you're kind of born with that. That's what I think. I, when I've listened, you know, even to like the mezzos, like Grace or somebody talk, you know, they were singing the high notes in the choir and, you know, when they were growing up. And then, so they, they already knew it was something different about their voice. They were already going to be classically, you know, <laughs> inclined. They probably had high notes and the people used it, but then they got directed in the right direction. But yeah, I think people, yeah. Because you even hear pop singers sometimes, they just you know they're singing and then they just pop off a high note you know it's it's in their voice mm -hmm. so how much of when in the in the on the topic of rage how much of that do you actually work on like when you're training if you already come in with it yeah i had to constantly work because my voice when it um became comfortable in that middle range where I'm saying the the dramatic soprano is, I had to keep working as a lyric when I practiced so that I could keep the high note. And I think long years ago, I always said I would do that. And I did all the way to the end. I never, whenever I rehearsed, I would maybe start with some Mimi arias, Legier, le, you know, light sounds and and all of these kind of arias and my art songs, I would keep that really going so that I could keep my voice fluid so that it could be launched into that higher, highest atmosphere. So keeping the voice like in a, in a very lyric flexible area allows you to have the strength to do all the loud things you're known for. Yes, so yes, well. absolutely, absolutely. And to be able to, because I think, you know, I, all, all, all the sopranos. You know, after a while, you just start having problems <laughs> about, you know, trying to hit those very extreme notes. So, yeah, and I think it kept me, as long as I sang like that, it kept me supple and able to, you know, for instance, when I was, you played that, that when I was 63. Now to be able to go and do that Otello aria with that A like that, that's a lyric, lyric sound and to do that pianissimo like that you have had to have some serious technique going to do that at 63 seriously <laughs> you know, and so i kept that going because every day when i practice i always you know see me kiamano me me and all of those things I would constantly put in before I, you know, bring out the big guns, the girls <laughs> start, you know, with Tosca's and doing all of those things. And then I'd end up, you know, with those things. But I'd start out with my lyric and I always did recitals because I thought that was just bomb for the voice. Just, you know, no orchestra, just you and the piano and creating those songs. Uh, and, and, and the lyric lines in them is so good for the voice. And I just think it's... Uh, a balm for the voice. It's just, it, I, you know, my manager when I first started out, because years ago in the 30s and things, you were just an opera singer. Leontine changed that. When she came along and was a concert singer and a, an a oratorio and, you know, recitalist. So we had coming after her a big bill to do. To, 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 to. So I was trained, you know, from university. You trained with the arias and things. I mean, uh, with the recitals. And so I just kept that going as long as I could because I knew that it was just 
who was it, Marin Anderson, mostly saying, you know, the recital work and oratorio. So for me, it would all work together to help me to me. I, it was difficult because there's so much repertoire that I had to, to learn, but um, it just kept my voice supple to do all of those other things, just, you know, besides singing opera. So um, in terms of a soprano voice um, as it matures, because you started very, very young and continued right. to sing opera, you know, up until, you know, present. Um, how, in, in the maturing, you know, stages of a career, do where you feel breaks, does range change? How does that soprano voice, you know, grow? You see, I was, this was a problem because people didn't change. They didn't change their repertoire. You, especially, you know, when you were a Met singer, you came in as a sabrette, that's what you were. You, you didn't, you didn't grow into people's eyes, you know? So, so that was different, you know, people got to see me change like that in front of their eyes. But normally that does not take place in such a big arena, you know, but, um, yeah, I, um, and, and, and I got a lot of flack about it too because they kept saying, well, why are you doing that? Just stay in, just stay in the lyric thing. Why are you doing this? You know, and they didn't want it. They didn't want me to do that. They didn't want me to change. I got a lot of flack about that. Uh, you know, you just have a hefty lyric. Don't, don't do that. Matter of fact, Jimmy was very upset I was changing. He, and I think I talked a little bit about that, Malika. He wanted me to, he wanted me to really be in the uh, Mozartian vein and uh, lyric, you know, the uh, ballad of Baby Doe, I don't know, these kind of things. Because he said, well, you can make a big mark in that area because nobody's done that with that kind of voice that you have. And so, I, but I, I was just, I just loved the repertory, you know, the other repertory. And so he said, okay, he gave up. <laughs> okay, he kept having meetings with me. Come on, Leon. <laughs> And I said, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. So, yeah, it was a struggle because most people are what they are forever. They don't change, uh, you know. Sometimes they go down, right? I mean, um, you know, sometimes the sopranos, when they lose the day at the high note, they'll go and do some mezzo repertory or vice, you know, like that. It was a Grace and Shirley went up. They started doing the sopranos. Because they had the affinity to do they could do that, right? They'd been listening their whole lot, and they said, I can sing that. And they did, you know, but uh, a lot of sopranos don't have that uh, luxury, really. When did you feel mature enough to get into the uh, heavier roles? Was it a certain amount of, like, I've been singing for a certain period of time, or was it an mm -hmm. age point? Or yeah, well, I, 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 I stayed away from that in my late 20s you know, maybe the very end of my late 20s, because people kept saying, you're not mature enough, you shouldn't do this and that. So I started with Butterfly, actually. Oh. And, but yeah, yeah, because, uh, you know, Butterfly, whoo, it, it's not, it's not a lyric, it's not a lyric, it's, I would call it a mixture of lyric and dramatic, because, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a heavy thing. And so I, I tested the waters, with uh, butterflies. As a matter of fact, my coach, you know, I kept pushing. I said, I want to do butterfly. He kept saying, well, he was the same vein. Well, you should just stay me, me, and do all of these Loretta's and things like that. So when I went and sang it for him, he went, okay, you have the heft, you have the weight, okay. And so I pulled him along. <laughs> so then he started seeing, you know, that I could actually do this other, these other pieces. So... But it's normally people come into their flock and that's what they are. You know, they don't change, you know. So, who is it? Um, now, they changed her, Isola Jones. She was a, a contralto personified. So, in order for her to do work, she became a mezzo. So, and she had problems doing that, you know, like at the beginning. It was difficult for her. Because, they, you know, that was in a higher range. They're asking her to... You know, do but she she asked it, and now I think she sings soprano in her sixties. Have you guys heard her? Yeah, actually, she it's funny soprano. you bring her up. I yeah, just... she's done a whole new technique that where yeah. she can do soprano, and I mean that is extreme because she was seriously like way low, low, low. Yeah, so it's 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 interesting, but 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 yeah, I was in my early thirties, I think, Matt starting to do that, and and. Uh, 
you know, and then that became my life. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, is the early 30s when your like real adult boy starts to come in? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. and it was known, uh, I think America likes, um, I don't know, it's because of, um, I don't know, the movies, television, everybody was obsessed with youth, and uh, who's the next new one coming in, and things like that, but really, the voice really matures about that time, and then the 30s and things, and then I heard a statement saying, oh, you're one of those over those 30, 30 something year old sopranos, and I mean, I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so when would you say like the voice at what around what age is like the voice really set? Because I know I have a book and a lot of singers, well, particularly women said they did their best singing after 40. So when would you say the voice really set? See, they don't, they don't, um, yeah, I was, it was all 35, 45, 48, 49. And when they're saying you're supposed to be finished, I was... I was not. I was not. I was sailing. That was amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And so. around, around what age would you say you're like, okay, um, I'm getting out of the I got Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think around probably 34, 34, 35. Yeah. And when do you not feel that? Right. <laughs> when did I not feel that? Yeah, around what age you say, oh, it's, it, things are changing. Really late. I, 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 um, I could have gotten up there in my 60s and, and still did that. Now, now it's a little bit, I mean, my body, I'm, I might look a certain way, but my body tells me I'm different. So I wouldn't want to sustain any of that now. And I remember Leontine said at 57 to me, I don't want to get down and up again off of any stage. <laughs> My just, and that was at 57. So I really went past that. But yeah, but but I could do, you know, concerts and stuff like that. But, but to actually, you know, put your whole body in there and do all of that. And I was just listening to you the other night. I went, oh my God, that's just one little one little duet that they just posted that from australia of the in, in um in the mess ball so that's one duet you have to do that kind of thing in every single act and that takes so much power and so much strength you know it's a sustained you know it's not one g that you're singing gorgeously and and a, and a space around <laughs> it's just on and on and on so you have to have strength to do that yeah I'd like to ask you about uh, Unbalo since you, uh, you just brought it up. Because mm -hmm. um, you've got this voice that started lyric, developed into a very beautiful spin toe, but could always move. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel like Amelia is one of those roles that really suits a woman with a heavy voice that can move? Yes, and it's one of the ones that uh, a lot of people, they shy away from because it, 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 it encompasses, you know, a little bit of coloratura, dramatic coloratura, and a lot of sustained uh, legato singing, but also the dramatic singing. And so all through the middle. So yeah, and if you can essay that, it's, it's, really, wor it's really worth it, you know, to do, and lyric singing too. You know, it's all in there. <laughs> so yeah, that, 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 that role, uh, that's one of the heavier, heavier ones that everybody cannot do. And it's only just a certain few people that have done it, I think, really well, you know, because it's, it's just a tour de force, yeah, that follow. But, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was admiring it. I went, oh, God, I, 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 I could not do that now. That's just amazing. Just, you just keep pouring sound out, just pouring it out, just over that orchestra, pouring it out. And it's and it was I loved doing that at the time. <laughs> to me, it was just fabulous. I loved it, you know. I loved it. Yeah, yeah. Um, as a uh, more of like that sort of soprano, mm -hmm. you described yourself earlier as a Verdi soprano. Mm -hmm. I've heard that written about like a lot of different women. Mm -hmm. What what does that mean to you? What does Verdi well, soprano? Mean? A Verdi soprano is one that sings Verdi. <laughs> I don't know. Listen, okay. The Verdi and Soprano. It's, 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 it's what I was just talking about. Because a lot of the roles 
you have to have coloratura a lot of the times then you have to have the lyric you have to have the dramatic and then you have to have um, I don't know he requires all of this in his singing and it's exposed it's so he gives you these big dramatic arias to do and and uh, it's so exposed that's what I'm gonna put it, it the technique really is it either is there or it's not especially you know even for the tenor like they hate that first aria and I eat <laughs> Because they're supposed to sing that B flat, you know, pianist to me, which they all never do. But it's like, <laughs> you know, Verity really requires all of these different techniques to sing his piece. And his women are really exposed. Now, you know, another opera that was like that was the Don Carlo, the doing Elisabetta. You know, you, you have to sing all of that little beautiful coloratura lyric singing in a lot of the spots and then and then he comes with two 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 Kayla Vanita you know at the end so dramatic and then you end with this lyric beautiful stuff oh my gosh so yeah so but Verdi is is way different uh, a lot of I'll, I'll see it like this when you do the Puccini roles which are wonderful but but sometimes the acting can help you in, in the Puccini, you don't have that in Verdi at all. It's all about the voice, and there is really no characterization other than what you can make. But the Puccini helps get away from people even maybe knowing that maybe you're not doing certain things. I'm going to tell you a quick story. One of my tenor friends said uh, he went to one of the Slavic countries, and the, the soprano was doing Butterfly. And, you know, at that end of that first duet, that high C that she does with the tenor. He said, instead of the soprano singing that high C, she just fainted. <laughs> and so, and so the people, they still clap because, you know, she did the high A and then she just fainted. And so it's part of the character. But yeah, so you can get away with <laughs> a little bit more maybe in Puccini, which is difficult on its own. But, ooh, speaking of that, that Man on, Man on La Skull, which, uh, oh, now to me. That was one of my best roles because I did, as you say, you got to do the Lora Sierra da Vida. You're doing that waltz and then you do the scaling to the high seas and and then you come back. Oh my God, Sola Perduta Abandonata, and all of those lines in that fourth act. Oh, I love loved Men on Let's Go. And then all those scenes with the choir. Uh, in that uh, second and third act where you just have to scale over that choir with that dramatic F's and G's and A. Oh, I just love Man on mm -hmm. Would you say there's a difference between a Verdian or Italian soprano and a German soprano? Yeah, I, 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 I think uh, that's different. Yeah, yeah, that's different. And I, I, I think that's why I did do more, you know, the Italian it. Uh, repertory than the German even though you all haven't heard it I don't know when they'll put it up I did an Ariadne in Australia nobody's heard it <laughs> at the end I did the Ariadne oh, wow. it was interesting it was interesting yeah. would you say that like a Strauss heroine like Ariadne or uh, a lot of those women that that sort of music sits in the same area as the Italian stuff or slightly lower or slightly lower to me slightly lower and it said it stays in that 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 uh, Ariadne is really in that middle C to F G you know so sort of in a mezzo-ish range yeah so but I have fun with that Ariadne yeah I was uh because I sang a lot of Strauss in my in my uh, recitals so the German I felt at home with it before we wrap up, uh, do you have any last questions, Matt, or anything? Um, so the one thing that I would still be curious about is um, what does the practice, as far as like when you say that you rehearse and you rehearse lyric, you sing lyric repertoire, what does daily practice look like for uh, for you for a soprano? What is that oh. sort of, is it different for other voice types, kind of exercising and practice you do? Oh, yeah, because that becomes, uh, you know, what teacher you have and what they are asking you to how you to practice. I love back in the dressing rooms. You, it sounds like a zoo back there because everybody <laughs> they're all 
technique as how they're going to get to these notes and things. It's extraordinary what the, you know, people ask them to do, you know, to, to warm up and things. It's, it's uh, uh, unbelievable. But, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I was interested because I was always listening to, you know, my colleagues. And for instance, I was listening to, let's say, Florence Quivara when we would do things. And, I, and she always went up to high E's and D's. And I thought that was so interesting, and because she was, all, and I don't know what the teacher imparted to her that she needed to do that, but it made her voice all agile and things. So that that was interesting to me, and um, so yeah, everybody has their own technique. Oh my God, you can't even pinpoint that. It's, it's, it's as varied as the teachers are varied, <laughs> you know, as to how they how they get to these notes. But for instance, when I, I, I my life was so busy. When I was, you know, all of this time, I, I, I just, I traveled over 300 days a year and I was always busy, you know, even if I wasn't on the airplane getting ready to, when I, when I was very young, in my 20s and 30s, I could just jump off the plane and go straight to a rehearsal and sing full voice and no problem. <laughs> that started getting a little bit harder in my 30s because I had a child and, and, and a lot of things were taking my uh, uh, energy, so 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 I I couldn't just jump off the plane and sing, but 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 I I uh, my my technique I I sang every day a lot, even off the stage I practiced, so my voice was very strong. It could withstand a lot, a lot of rehearsing and a lot of when I think about it, just amazing. Yeah, so. Oh. But that was great. That was great because it made your voice pliable and you were able to, you, you know, for instance, a singer, every time you went to a new production, uh, that conductor, that was his say on how that piece went. The, the, unless you got to, you know, higher, higher status, you could tell the conductor how you wanted to do it. But most times it was their way. And so you had to be able to... Uh, take all different kind of tempo than what you were accustomed to. And and as a professional, that's what you had to do. I, I remember, you know, like Luciano, for instance, okay, he could tell most of the people, no, I don't want it that fast, or I want it this way, or I want it that way. But uh, even he, you know, <laughs> even he at the Met, I remember one rehearsal, we were doing the Ernani's, and a, one of the con house conductors were doing it and he was telling him how it should go but when Jimmy came in he did not do that <laughs> he, he went on and he went on and did what Jimmy said <laughs> but it's very hard on the singer because it's like you can't depend on how you learned it in the studio you have to be so agile and be able to go uh, however the conductor wants and then it changes it, it you know your changes your breath flow and everything if they take it too fast or too slow for you you can imagine so you have to adapt every time when you're in rehearsal with these people uh, who is it I tell the story about Leontine the 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 cabaletta for a trovatore you know okay so so we know that could go you know, this is the difference between a regular coloratura and a dramatic coloratura. It can't be so light and so fast for a dramatic voice. It's going to be more heft than things to get it up. So maybe some conductors know that and maybe they don't. So anyway, this particular uh, production, the, the Inez was supposed to walk her back to the back of the stage. And I heard from my coach, she whispered in her ears, My dear, you must get back there yourself. I have my own problems. <laughs> be able to have any breath if she walked her back there and came back to start that arm. <laughs> and so, yeah, so sometimes that can be um, really, really amazing that we have to be so adaptable to each conductor. I, I thought that was amazing in my career that you had to adjust every single time. Mm. I just got one more question over something you just mentioned about your child. So I know there's that Aida from 88 and orange, orange. oh yes uh, yes uh -huh. you were you were you were pregnant correct yeah what what how does being pregnant oh no 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 i was not pregnant in the orange i was pregnant when i did um a trovatore in uh it's it's online it was in um 
I'm trying to remember, which was within a French country. And, uh, oh my God. And I had gone on bed rest for four months and then I went and got up and did that, uh, trouble so, so But, how but how, but, but then, it, but then that was scary because, uh, to you guys, I had had three miscarriages and at my fourth month. And so this particular son that I have, the doctor said, you have to go on bed rest. So I have to cancel all my contracts. Tracks. And I went on bed rest, and so this was my first thing out of the deal. So I was really nervous about doing much movement or doing anything. So that was very difficult. It was very, but I kept the baby. And I'm going to tell you all another story. It was difficult. I went on tour with this same pregnancy, and I was seven months pregnant doing uh, Hernani's on tour. And so, uh, I, as I was doing on tour, we went on tour, you know, it may have been four weeks or something. I kept getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> and the conductor said, wait a minute. <laughs> he said, are you going to have that baby on stage? And so, um, I, I did. I was very tired. I, I remember just putting on the costume and and doing everything. I was just miserable at, toward the end. And I had the baby a month later, so I really stretched myself. So, you know, I, I remember crying like, I don't think I can sing. I sang well, but it was so exhausting. I don't know. I, don't, I haven't talked to Jackie or Kiri or anybody. I don't know that they did that. I don't know. I, I don't know. And uh, so did pre the pregnancy or does pregnancy, how does that impact the woman's voice? Yeah, that voice? impacted me a lot. I had an Aida in Berlin after that and my mm -hmm. baby was six weeks old. I had to cancel a butterfly. Uh, I was supposed to do it like four weeks later and I was too weak. I couldn't even, my stomach muscles, everything was too weak. And uh, I, uh, oh, he was so upset with me. He, uh, anyway, I won't say what he said to me, but he was so upset with me having a baby and canceling. Okay, so, but anyway, the next contract was Berlin, and I was to do my, I eat in my Berlin debut, and I was very weak, six weeks, but I managed to, I managed to do that, I eat, and that, and then I was okay after that, but it was really something, and I remember, I'm going to tell you guys this, Kiri Takanawa said to me, uh, after that, she said, Leona, I don't know why you would go through that. <laughs> She said, just adopt those babies. Don't go through it. Because <laughs> that's what she did. You, you know, but anyway. So that, 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 but it was difficult. It really, and it made my voice to me slightly lower. It was a little bit more difficult to go to the high C. That's when I maybe started having a little problem. Because my voice kind of centered a little bit lower. Yeah. Before so, or after? After. Okay, so what about during? Was it easier to sing? I've heard someone say it's easier. I didn't to sing. have any, you know, up until till I got. I didn't even show until five months, so I I was fine. I was jumping around doing everything. I didn't feel anything. I didn't. It was no problem. It was just at the end when I shouldn't have been doing that. I should. I was traveling in an airplane every week to somewhere. That was too much for a pregnant mother. Seven months. It was too much, and I don't think they let you do that now anyway. If it's seven months, you get to get not. They don't want you on those airplanes because <laughs> you could possibly have that baby. So, but yeah, but but, but all during up until that point, uh, when I'm uh, singing that butterfly at the Met Gala, I was four weeks pregnant. I just didn't know it. <laughs> I was four weeks pregnant. Yeah. So. All right, well, any last words from you, Matt, and Leona before we uh, say goodbye? Aww. Cannot oh, thank you enough thanks. for spending this time with us. Cannot thank you enough, Miss Matt. Oh, thank you, Matt. You look like you could be one of my children, doesn't he? <laughs> it does. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for showing interest and and uh doing this i appreciate it very much thank you leona you know i'm like you know what about you so just thank you for talking to us about this and just letting the people know so i, I can't wait to share yeah, malik, this but malik you're doing such a great service uh doing this site and and with the pop singers and the classical singers what a gift to the world to yes. hear, hear this wow you guys thank you so much thank i appreciate you. it i love 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 doing